And welcome back to Cairns. We're in the Museum of Australian Armour and Artillery and looking at the M3 Medium Part 2. And you get a bonus. This is a case of buy five, get one free because you just had a stupid amount of people in this tank. Now, the British version, because the radio operator was uh, superfluous, because the radio was now accessible to the commander, generally only had a crew of six. But yes, the American version, Ali, you had a seventh man in the hull. Uh, this led to a small problem. The Soviets, of course, famously described this vehicle as the coffin for seven brothers, which does it a little bit of a disservice, but you know, we'll kind of get back to that in a bit. TC's position, three-man turret, so he's a little bit back and left. Uh, he has a rotating cupola, which I have to say rotates very easily. A simple two-piece hatch. Of course, as the nod to silhouette issues, the British got rid of the, the silly cupola. Uh, and it very simply folds up and inwards, and it is the simplest system for locking the cupola hatch shut that I've ever seen in my life. He does have, for 360-degree observation, a rotatable periscope. Uh, obviously, the periscope itself has been dismounted, but it does rotate. It's not as good as a traditional uh, vision cupola, uh, but it's better than just having a fixed uh, forward or left. And in all fairness, there is no obstructions on the turret roof to get in its way, except maybe the antenna mount. Not much else to be said on the outside of this turret, so uh, let's have a look inside. All right, so now we come into the vehicle and because of this massive skylight crime, you've had to shut part of the hatch here. So, um, yeah, this is not a vehicle for standing up in on the inside. That said, the commander seat, which would ordinarily be here, has multiple attachment points. It can be easy to lift it up and down. Uh, you can't be sitting there and you got to actually get off the seat to do it. Uh, but you do have a lot of flexibility to where you're going to be. Now, in terms of turret size, this is actually quite good. The turret diameter is only six inches smaller than that of an M4 medium. Except instead of a big 75 millimeter and lots of ammunition, you've got a small little 37. So that's actually pretty good. Uh, although it is interesting to note that things are slightly angled. If you're looking at the top down into this turret, uh, if the gun is facing this way, the gunner is actually facing inward. And so would the commander be if he's sitting down with his knees clear of the gunner. And uh, there's not actually much for the commander to play with in here. He has the bulge back here for the number 19 wireless set. And he does have the pistol port if uh, the gunner doesn't want to shoot. And uh, that's the gist of it, I'm afraid. It's uh, a very simple uh, position for the commander. So uh, let's hop down to the gunner seat directly in front of me. So the gunner is located front left of the turret, uh, the feet of the commander. It's got actually a surprisingly reasonable amount of room. Uh, Traverse is both power and manual. Uh, the pump for the power system is actually located under my seat. Elevation could be manual by use of the old-fashioned hand crank or stabilized. Now the stabilizer system in its, its entirety has been removed from vehicles, so I guess shows you whether or not the Australians uh, like the stabilizer function. In order to apply the stabilizer, you would have to physically disconnect the elevation gearing, turn on the stabilizer system, and then the hand wheel will be used uh, to stabilize the gun uh, obviously only in elevation and uh, it, it's not a case that you're going to get great first round hits especially with a 37 uh, but it will at least give you a uh, more reasonable chance of doing something like HE or canister uh, or if nothing else you're going to be faster laying onto a target because you won't have to reacquire the target when the tank stops or you already have it more or less in your side picture. The site itself is a periscopic site. It's the uh, M2 with the M19. It is a very simple system. It's got a series of dots. The center dot is uh, not the zero range as you would expect. It's actually 600 yards. Ammunition is uh, a pretty good variety actually. There's armor piercing, there's high explosive for whatever good a 37 millimeter high explosive round is. Uh, canister, blanks, dummies and uh, they're stowed all around this vehicle, all sorts of room for it. Uh, the gun itself, 37 millimeter M6, uh, it's basically a development of the M5, except now you have a semi-automatic breech. Uh, you could actually put the M5's barrel onto it, it's a slightly shorter barrel. Not recommended, the manual specifically advises against because what would happen if you do that, then the mount becomes out of balance. It affects the stabilizer for sure, but it will even make the hand cranks a little bit more difficult to use. 
You can see the manual trigger for the 37 here. Uh, of course, he does have the coaxial caliber 30 on the far side. The seat itself is actually pretty comfortable. It's a bucket seat, for lack of a better word. Uh, you got bolsters on the side to stop you from bouncing off to the side. You got a nice high backrest, and it is adjustable in height. It's, it's a sort of a you unscrew a clamp, it springs up and down, then you screw the clamp back into place. Uh, we're actually more like a vice than a clamp, actually. Uh, other features in here, there is the turret traverse lock uh, located here. You can see the teeth scattered around. He has his uh, pistol port here if she wishes to shoot with the 45 caliber. If for some reason the uh, cal uh, caliber 30 and the 37 millimeter canister doesn't do the job. Uh, range of elevation and depression, it's seven degrees down and 60, that's six zero up, which is uh, pretty good. Uh, you can only imagine when this thing was used uh, in the jungle, uh, fire canister to clear Japanese from the treetops. And uh, it does actually beg the question, can you use 37mm canister in the high altitude, uh, high angle anti-aircraft roll? I doubt it will have the effective range. I mean, you probably want to be within 300 yards of the airplane when you shoot, but you never know. Anyway, that's it for this side of the vehicle. So uh, let's have a quick look at the loader side. Not that there's much there, it's basically ammo. So hopping over to the loader side, uh, obviously first of all he's primarily responsible for the coaxial, it's an M1919A4 caliber 30 machine gun. British tanks would have 4,084 rounds of 30 cal stowed, uh, mainly for the coaxial. The American tanks with the caliber 30s when you have they had 9,200 rounds. In terms of the 37 millimeter, you see it's uh, scattered all around the turret here and interestingly it's stowed nose down. Uh, it's 128 rounds are carried. Uh, an American tank would have 178. Not least because you don't have the radio in the back, so you can just stow more 37 millimeter ammo. To actually load is actually pretty simple because the round is so small, pull it out, lift it up, and just slam it in with your fingers, fingertips, basically. The ammunition for the caliber 30 is stowed on the far side of the main gun. There's actually a feed chute that comes over the top. To his right, we have stowage for the two inch smoke bombs. Now this fits through a hole here and it looks like a big pistol. Put your smoke bomb in here, fire it out, uh, and hey presto, you have yourself a bit of a smoke screen. Obviously later on, this would turn into the smoke grenade launchers which are mounted on the outside that we all know and love today. In addition to the stowage inside the turret, there's an additional rack for more than I want to count rounds to the front left of the turret. And uh, you can also have a good access here through the turret floor. The panels all open up and uh, you can access the batteries which are underneath the turret basket. There's also additional stowage in between the turret basket and the side door. So this uh, single cylinder job here is the auxiliary motor. It's got a two and a half gallon fuel tank just above it. And this is used uh, primarily to power generator. So you have electrics uh, going to the systems without the use of the main engine, which adds wear, it adds fuel usage. Uh, it is also connected to the heater. The heater can be used to preheat the main engine if you're trying to start on a really cold day. Or amazement of amazements, you can use it to heat up the crew compartment, a little known luxury back in the early 40s. If you let your battery drain a little bit too far, you can remove the housing on top of the magneto. It reveals a rope for hand starting the vehicle, just like on a, an old lawnmower. Forward instead of back, you have ammunition racks again for 37 millimeter. Loads of 37 in this tank. So if you want to open up one of the pistol ports, see it's a little spring to catch, and you can just push down, lift it up. Sort of locks into place, you spray away with your 45 Thompson. And just, when you're done, lock it back into place. All right, so if you wanted to get from the turret to the hull, um, there is 
two ways of doing it. One is that the turret basket at the left-hand side of the turret is actually pretty much open to allow you to get in through the whole door. So you can spin the turret over to the three o'clock position and that gives you a pretty good access. However, you can see they've actually left a hole here at the front of the turret. So it is possible to just simply clamber straight down. Uh, which I'm about to do now, assuming I don't kick the cameraman in the face because it's a, it's a tank, it's actually still pretty claustrophobic in here. One knock on the head already. There we go. And we're in. So immediately forward of the turret basket, this is where the seventh man would be if you wanted to have a seventh man in the tank. It is the radio operator's position here, so they would have a backrest here, cushion. Obviously with the radio being in the turret on the grant, there is no need for the man or the seat. Although I guess you could put one if you wanted, especially if for some reason you did wish to retain the 30 caliber in the bow. You can see the interior fittings for it here. Adjustable in elevation, no way of aiming. So uh, near as I can tell, this little periscope up here, uh, it does rotate, but uh, since the gun doesn't traverse, you might as well just have it facing forward. So the radio operator will be adjustable for elevating the gun. The driver would be responsible for aiming the gun in azimuth. Completely inefficient, waste of space, waste of money, waste of everything. Uh, of interest, there is a tank to my left here, and as near as I can tell, it is a water tank for drinking water. Very useful in the desert. I don't know off the top of my head if this was a standard feature or just something that the British and Australians added a little bit later. I can see why it might perhaps have been taking up space um, for a radio. Uh, this, it's, it's a fairly big tank, but uh, a very nice, thoughtful feature. To his right, the driver. To his further right, so all three are in sort of a, a triangular formation, is the 75 gunner. So next thing I'll do is hop into the driver's seat and uh, you can see the relatively unfortunate position that the driver has to suffer with. So as you hop into the driver's seat, you can see he sits astride the transmission, one, on, uh, one leg on each side. And I don't know, maybe motorcycle riders are good with this. This is something completely unusual for me and I don't know how, how long I, could, uh, I can handle it. Uh, there is a pedal on each side, the clutch on the left-hand side, the accelerator is on the right. Brakes are controlled by the steering pillars. So you put, pull both back and uh, that'll stop. There is a parking brake down low on the left-hand side, but uh, that is purely a lock. It's, it's pretty much a physical lock in the transmission, as I can tell from the manual. So uh, there's a reason the manual says do not use the parking brake as a service brake. Now on most of the M3 tillers, on the very top would be the triggers, uh, one on each tiller, for each of the two machine guns. Uh, you can imagine why they would be removed together with the, uh, with the rest of the machine guns, but that was how you fired them. The dash is pretty much a standard dash, very simply uh, laid out. So you got the booster and the starter uh, switch, this is for your headlights, uh, wipers, I kid you not, it says wipers, and I'm not entirely sure what it is they're supposed to be wiping. Um, maybe I'm doing it a disservice. Uh, fuel cut off, so when you're done with the engine, hit the fuel cut off, and uh, engine dies. Magneto control, so left, right, or both, or off. A compass. Yes, a magnetic compass, and you kind of wonder how can they have one in a tank? Well, yeah, the same way you have one in ships. Um, curiously, there are actually, there is on any metal object a point of neutrality. I can't remember the exact name of it. But if you place your magnetic compass on this point, uh, it's not going to be affected by the metal of the, uh, of the vehicle. So if I recall correctly, on the Scorpion, it's actually the, the, you know, the British CBRT. It's actually located pretty conveniently uh, atop the turret between the uh, commander and the gunner. Um, as we keep on going, um, it should be noted that in early World War II, uh, there was an attempt made in an inertial navigation system that the tank itself would, would remember by, gy by use of gyroscopes where it was in, on the map. And if you think about it, remember in North Africa in the desert, there's no navigation features. I mean, the one dune looks pretty much like another. And of course, when you have before GPS, you're stuck with celestial navigation. You're basically using a sextant uh, with the stars or the sun. 
Um, or if you have the inertial navigation system, then fantastic. Of course, in practice, the INS um, didn't enter service. I have an article up in the Chief and Satch about it, but uh, we move on. Uh, there is a clock if you want to know what time it is. And uh, I guess it's, it's a wind-up clock. Cool. Uh, engine hours. Oil temperature, oil pressure, voltmeter, ammeter, speedometer. Goes up optimistically enough to 50 miles an hour. And the tachometer, which goes in reverse. So idle is on the right-hand side and all the way to the anti-clockwise position is 3000 RPM. Uh, it was, should be limited at, I believe, 2400. Uh, gear lever is on his right-hand side. It's a fairly standard uh, pattern. So you would have to release a latch to put it into first or reverse on the left hand side. The first gear is really just for uh, special circumstances. You're mired, you're towing something really bad, you're going up an incredibly high hill. Ordinarily, your gear pattern is going to be two to the four. So two, three, four, five. Very easy. So as you're steering, uh, it is a control differential. And uh, what this means is that on the good news, there's always power going to both tracks as you're going around the corner. The bad news is that there is a minimum radius. In this case, it's 31 feet. Want to get going? Uh, if the engine's cold, you got a fuel primer here. Uh, obviously, of course, as mentioned before, you want to hand crank the uh, engine a couple of revolutions just to make sure that the oil is nicely spread out. Uh, go ahead, prime it, hit boost, hit start. Uh, of course, your mags are set for both, otherwise it's not going to work. Uh, idle it at about 800, give it, a, uh, give it a rev test, and just like if you're, if you're playing around in a Cessna, you check your mags, uh, so both to uh, right, and you see that there's a drop of about 75 revs. Go back to both, go to L, so you drop at 75 revs, and uh, that, that has just tested your two banks of magnetos. Uh, after a warm-up period of about two or three minutes, go ahead, put it in the second, and away you go. Uh, when you're done, pretty much reverse. You stop, you idle for a couple of minutes, you let it cool down. Uh, obviously, you're in neutral, you set your parking brake, fuel cut off, you're done. To see how the driver has his vision port, obviously this is in the I'm not getting shot at position. Uh, and when you are in combat, you would have to release this uh, locking uh, support. It's kind of frozen into place, so I can't do it. This is a swing divisor down, and there is a small little uh, periscopic slit, basically, he looks out of. Um, of course, uh, I am way forward. I, mean, I, I guess, in theory, if, uh, if you're a World War II sized person and you had to get out in a hurry, you probably could squeeze out through here. I'm not sure it's ideal. Um, but if you did have to get out of this tank and hurry and you're in either the radio operator's position or the driver's position, good luck. Um, this is probably not the easiest tank to get out of. Well, your fault for getting hit in the first place. Alright, so the next thing I'm going to do is going to hop over one more seat to the right and check out the gunner's position for the 75. Okay, so we're now seated behind the controls for the wonderful 75mm gun M2. And dear God, you do not want to be a tall person driving this. I have hit my head so many times off this. I, you have to be wearing a hard shell. And I'm, I'm actually, I was talking with the camera a little earlier about this, but I'm developing a sort of a sixth sense for when your head is about to hit something. And my little alarm bell is perpetually going off as I'm sitting here. So uh, I'm not gonna move my head around too much, I hope and uh, forgive me if I, feel, if I appear perhaps a little bit concerned about my safety. All right, so um, traverse and elevation controls. Here and here, that easy. Now, curiously, and this is one of those issues that comes up when you're doing research, and I may mention before how primary source documentation differs. There are two manuals which cover the system. One is the manual for the tank medium M3. And according to that, the gun traverse on this is 15 degrees to each side. Maximum depression is 9, maximum elevation is 19. Okay, fantastic. But then there is also a manual for gun 75mm M2 mounted in tanks. Well, basically this, because it was the only tank really that the M2 was mounted in. It says 14 degrees to each side, 7.5 down and 20 up. Make of that what you will. 
So the M2 fired an AP round at about 1850 feet per second, the HE round is 1400. However, the US lack of proper experience with the large caliber tank gun uh, really began to show through when they shipped these over to the British and the British started using them. Uh, the first problem they had was with the HE fuses. The HE fuses were designed to be fired from artillery. So as you can imagine, the round would land more vertical than not, and it was all very good for the fuse that set off. However, when fired from a tank at infantry at ranges as close as 300 yards, uh, what's going to happen is that the, the round is going to basically graze the ground and the fuse may not detonate. This was considered to be a bit of a problem. Uh, the other problem that they had was that the M72 shot, which was the, the basic armor-piercing round at the time, had issues with the face-hardened armor of the Panzer III and Panzer IV. Uh, once you went over about you know, 500 yards, the, the round would shatter, it wouldn't penetrate. And think about it, the Panzer III only had like 5 centimeters of armor. Um, this is also considered to be a bit of a problem. The British solved both problems. For the HE round, what they did was they found a stock of French 75 in Syria. They shipped that over. The French artillery around the fuse was a bit better. And because the American 75 was basically derived from the French round, it was a simple matter of unscrewing to one, screwing on the other, and you know, had a functioning 75mm HE round. To solve the AP round issue, uh, they turned to the Germans. They had captured about 50,000 uh, tons worth of munitions on the drive to Dubrovnik. And amongst this haul was a whole bunch of AP rounds for the German 7.5cm uh, L24 is fired on the Panzer IV. And a British officer realized that, uh, well, what you could do, and the guy's name was Major Northey, um, was just by tweaking the driving band on the German ammunition, you can mount it to the American cartridge, and all of a sudden you get a better AP round. So they did uh, a whole bunch of those. They also at the same time got the, the improved American M61 round and they tried those off and they realized that the two rounds actually had a much better amount of penetration at a thousand yards. You could punch through a Panzer IV's front, fantastic. The German round is still preferred though because the German round had a bursting charge. So once you punched through, it did more damage. The American round just made a hole and basically had spalling and significant emotional events. And, uh, I mean, it wasn't bad. Uh, you don't want to have a 75mm round bouncing around inside your tank, regardless of whether it explodes afterwards or not. Anyway, um, the gun was fully stabilized. As mentioned, you did have to have the counterweight on the front. To aim the gun, the primary sight is the M21 periscope. Uh, this was graduated to 3,000 yards in 500 yard increments for AP only. If you wanted to shoot HE, me, you took your best guess, and I guess a burst and adjust method was probably re required to finally put rounds onto target. Now, there was a problem with this. The linkage between the sight and the gun wasn't great. As a result, later model M3s came with the direct vision telescope, it's a T15, it's basically a coaxial telescope that was considered to be a lot more accurate. Linkage problems did continue on. We had the, exactly the same problem with the early versions of the M4 Sherman as well. Solved exactly the same way for the direct vision scope. Uh, last thing I'll point out is that the gunner seat is attached to the casemate. So as the gun is rotated, the gunner seat moves with it. Uh, which is fine because it keeps his head in pretty good position compared to the sight. And uh, let's say he's got enough room for his leg that he's not going to get too badly crushed. So that's it for the gunner's position. One more to go. The last position in the tank, number six or seven, depending on which version you are, the loader for the main gun, 75 millimeter. Uh, it's a god awful position, I'm afraid to say. It's, it reminds me a little bit of the, uh, the Egg Panther 38T. He is directly behind the tube, and his job is to get rounds, 35 of which are stowed down here, out, and then forward, and into the tube. Now, there are 65 rounds available to the British loader. 35 of them here, I'm not entirely sure where the others go. Hopefully it's over by the radio, compart uh, radio operator's compartment, uh, and just removed from this vehicle. Here we have storage for yet more 37 millimeters, so you can imagine which was supposedly the primary used weapon half the time. 
American tanks, they only had 50 rounds of 75, and that's where I'm coming with this conclusion that perhaps the British extra ammo comes with the, re uh, the deleted radio ram. Above them, we do have the roof hatch, uh, another way of getting in and out, and frankly, if you're driving along in the desert, it's probably great to stick your head out and uh, get a bit of fresh air as you're driving, you know, wind blowing through your, your helmet. There is directly behind him another pistol port, and there is a fuel tank gauge just here to the left behind the basket. You can also see the propeller shaft, which is covered with a protective housing so the loader doesn't have his legs deleted. That's it for the interior. Uh, we're gonna hop out and close up. Of the approximately 5,667, approximate number, uh, accepted it from the factories, the Lend Lease took the majority of them. The British received just shy of 2,900 and the Soviets about 1,400. Uh, the M3 was very well accepted in the British service. It was reliable, it had a good gun, things that British tanks did not have. Uh, the Soviets had a more mixed opinion on the thing. Yeah, it was reliable, yeah, it was well built, but uh, it didn't really suit the Soviet terrain, and frankly, the Soviets were already building some pretty reasonable tanks of their own, so it's much less of an improvement. The vehicle did continue to see service, of course, it was made obsolete by the M4 Medium, the Sherman. Uh, but if you went to East Asia in the jungles against the Japanese, who frankly didn't have great anti-tank weapons to begin with, and certainly the tanks were pretty miserable, uh, the M3 was still a very capable vehicle, and so it saw service pretty much through to the end of the war. Initially, the production run was only going to be 350 vehicles. However, the demand from the UK in particular was so great for 75mm gun tanks that they couldn't afford to stop producing tanks on the factory to retool to build the better M4. So it wasn't until later when more tank production plants came online that they were finally able to phase out production of the M3 and move to the Sherman, which would serve the Allies for the rest of the war. That was it. I uh, hope you enjoyed your tour of the M3 Medium. We'll see you on the next one.